This morning we're continuing our series on um, atomic discipleship. Uh, today is a, a day in our worship life where we're trying something new that we haven't done in a little while. So I'm, I'm happy to have Joe Carpenter here with me as I told him my, my guinea pig. Uh, he is our first worship assistant or liturgist as you know. So I'm honored to have Joe uh, <clears throat> with me this morning. We also uh, have our acolytes uh, back in action this morning. Uh, so this morning as we continue our worship service, let us be reminded that we are here uh, because where Jesus says wherever three, two, or three, two or three are gathered in his name, there he is also. And so we gather today in the name of the resurrected Christ in his presence, and we focus our hearts and minds upon God's goodness and grace as we worship together today. Please stand as you're able for our call to worship. We'll be reading from Psalms 105, verses 1 through 5. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Seek the Lord in his strength. Sink his presence continually. As we worship, we remember the wonderful works he has done for us and for all. Glory to God. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is Christ for the World We Sing on page 568, and the words will also be on the screen.
Let us join together in confessing our faith as expressed in the Apostles' Creed, page 881, and the words are also on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning as we prepare for a time of prayer amongst ourselves and as a body this morning, I have a few uh, concerns that I'd like to bring before you this morning. Um, first, I heard yesterday that Julie Morris's father, Olin Baines, uh, passed away yesterday at the age of 95, so we want to keep Tim and Julie and all their family, uh, the family of Olin, in, their, in our prayers. Also, um, Judy Overzet has been in the hospital. She had a fall, and she tested positive for COVID, uh, so please pray for her healing. Uh, also, Mr. Don uh, told me earlier uh, that he heard a read in the paper this morning that a former member from here, some of you may know, Nancy Ream, uh, passed away, uh, and uh, her husband, Tom. So please remember Tom and their family. Uh, also, a few more here, uh, Mark Fisher, the son-in-law of Jim and Pam Fleming. Uh, so far, good news from the physicians. Please continue to pray for Mark's healing. Uh, please continue to pray for Debbie Bruins, the daughter-in-law of Jill McCord. Uh, she is in the hospital. Continued prayers for her healing. Uh, also, I have a few, few of the members that we have who are uh, out with COVID today. Uh, pray for these who, uh, Wally Wickey and Betty Pike and, Betty, and uh, Lisa Johnson are just a handful, but there are several more. Uh, so please, I uh, just want to remind you to just take care of yourself. And if you're not feeling well, particularly during this season where we all like to be inside in the air conditioning, uh, just if you're not feeling well, just go ahead and stay at home. We'll catch up with you next Sunday. Uh, so just wanted to to let you know that, and uh, please be in prayer for all those who are out with uh, sickness and illness today. As, as we, um, I know there are many more. We're going to have a time in our prayer this morning where we'll be, be able to pause and, and lift those silently together, uh, but I want to invite you just to come and join me for a moment and time of prayer this morning, uh, and then as we have a moment, we will also begin to pray ourselves uh, for the needs that are on our hearts and minds today, and we'll conclude our time of prayer with the Lord's Prayer, that can be found on page 885 in your hymnal, or the words will be available for you on the screen should you need that aid, but we'll be praying that in unison. I invite you to join me now as we go before the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we gather this morning in your name to be an encouragement to one another and to glorify your holy name. As these days of summer seem to be moving rapidly into the fall, our attention is continually drawn forward into what's next, planning for what is coming down the road. 
we begin to think about all that's coming. Some parents come at what's coming next in this school year and the demands on our families. For some of us, it's a season in which we are very focused on our health and, and wondering how we can maintain such good, uh, healthy standards in our life. For some of us, we're thinking about moving forward and returning to regular work schedules, preparing for retirement, or enjoying it. So many things that are looming on the horizons of our life that our focus can often be placed solely and directly on them. Be with us, loving God. Remind us to place our focus on Jesus, who calls us to trust in his mercy and his care. Keep the needs of others in our hearts and minds, needs for healing, for comfort, for friendship, Help us to reach out to them and offer our gifts and service in your name. We name these dear ones this morning with our voices and in our hearts to you in these next moments of silence. As you have loved and healed us, so we ask for your healing mercies on those whom we have named before you this morning. We ask for your guidance. We ask for your patience with us as we go marching through the seasons of this life. Give us the grace and strength so that we may do it confident in Jesus' love for us and one another. As we continue to pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I invite all of our children to come forward for our children's time uh, and uh, join Mr. Steve down here down front. Hi, guys. How you doing? Hey guys, how you doing? All right, all right, there we go. We got one. How are you doing? Oh, everybody's shy this morning. All right, how many of you have a really, really good friend? How do you get to know that? Oh, Jathaniel has a friend too. One. How do you get to know that friend a little better? What do you say, Phoebe? You tell them their name and they tell their name. You get each other's name, sure. Anybody else? How do you get to know your friend a little bit better? Hey, bud. You can talk to them. You talk to them. You ask them questions. You find out what they like, what they don't like. How do you get to know Jesus a little bit better? Talk to Jesus. How do you talk to Jesus? You pray. What else can you do? You can sing, absolutely. How about, you ever heard of the Bible? Can you read the Bible? Does that get you a little bit closer to Jesus too? That's all right. We'll get you there. What's that, Phoebe? It gets you a lot closer, doesn't it? Well, in our, in our scripture verse today, we're going to be reading about one of the disciples, Philip. Have you ever heard of Philip as a disciple? He's one of the disciples. And Philip was one of these guys that was very calculated in whatever he did. He wanted to have instructions for everything. He wanted to have a, a guide on how to do everything. 
And he was the kind of guy that if you asked him what time it is, he'd tell you how to make a watch. He would give you this long explanation on everything. He was dubbed a bean counter. So kind of like a, an accountant or an engineer. Sorry, I don't mean to make fun of those guys. But that's kind of the type of person in today's world, that's what he would be. And in, this, in, in the verse, Jesus is telling all of his disciples, they've been together for three years, and he's telling all of his disciples, hey guys, first Thomas had asked, said, show us the way. And Thomas says, or I'm sorry, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody goes to the Father except by me. And then Philip says, show us the Father. And I'm sure Jesus is just kind of shaking his head. And he says, oh, Philip, anybody that has seen me has seen the Father. And I heard recently, which, which made me feel like I, it gave me a better understanding. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, give 100%? No? Play any sports? Say, go out there and give it 100%. Or give it 110%. Ever heard that? No? Okay. <laughs> Parents, we need to work on that a little bit. <laughs> Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. So I call him the 200% person. He was, he was all God and he was all man. And that's what, that's what Philip was asking and that's what Jesus was saying. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And that was, that's the message that Pastor Jathaniel is going to share with us today. Okay? Let's bow in prayer, and will you guys repeat after me? Okay. Dear Father, thank you for this day. We pray for Miss Stacy and that she will feel better. Help us to understand you more. And draw closer to you through prayer, through the Bible, through our singing, and sharing others with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Head on back to your... As our children are making their way either back to their seat or to Children's Church this morning, I want to uh, prepare us for our time of giving this morning. I uh, have a brief story I want to share with you about how the offering plate is used. I bet you've always wondered, how is the offering plate used? Have you ever wondered that? I have a little story here for you. There's a, a new pastor that was visiting the church. Uh, and He actually came to a church and he started visiting his uh, parishioners uh, door to door. And at one house it seemed obvious that somebody was home, but they wouldn't come to the door. So he repeatedly knocked and called their name and nobody came out. And, and after, after a minute or so, he took out his business card and he left it in the door. On the back of it, he wrote Revelations 3, Revelation 3.20 on the back of it, stuck it in the door, walked off. Well, when the offering was, uh, uh, the next Sunday, the offering was received and processed at the ne next worship service. Um, after the service, they were going through, they were counting the, the offering, and uh, as it goes, the pastor was handed a note and said, this was in the offering for you. And he found that his card had been returned to him the one that he had written Revelation 3.20 on, and it had another cryptic message. It said Genesis 3.10. Reaching for his Bible to check out the citation, he broke up in gales of laughter. He was just yucking it up because Revelation 3.20 said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Genesis 3.10 says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, for I was naked. <laughs> um. So I guess that's one way that the offering plate can be used. But typically we use the collection plate for this and this alone. It's how we receive and make gifts 
to the ongoing mission and ministry of the church, making gifts to God. And I know many of us uh, see these offering plates, and you're like, well, I, I know many of you give faithfully and regularly online or electronically, and you've set that to, to, uh, to, to give automatically, which is a tremendous blessing to the church because what happens is it helps us remain faithful in our giving and support of the church even when we're not able to be here. But the plate itself is just a reminder for us not that God has God's hands out, but it is the opportunity for us to place our hands in so that we may continue to give and be faithful and generous back to God the way that He has been generous to us. And it's not just about our money. It is about our whole life, our time and our energy and all of our resources. May we continue to be faithful and grow in generosity, most importantly during this time as we give our gifts back to the Lord and to his work through our church. May we be blessed through the act of faithful generosity. Will you pray with me, please? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this day that you've given us. There are many ways that uh, these plates can be used. Actually, some places use baskets, and some churches use buckets, and some churches use um, uh, other, uh, other, de other devices and, and tubs and pots uh, to collect these resources for your work. But more importantly, Lord, it is not what the vessel looks like that matters. It is our hearts. It is the way in which we are generous back to you because everything that we have has passed through your fingers and that you have given to us and given to us freely. So what matters most is that we reach deep into our lives so that we may convey our generosity back to you, whether that be through placing financial resources back into the mission and ministry of your church here at Covenant. May that be giving of our time and energy to support the ongoing mission of your church here at Covenant and beyond. Or may it simply be by being present and offering our prayers and presence, as well as our gifts and witness and service. Remind us of your great love for us. Encourage us and grant us grace to receive, but not only that, but to give just as we have received, freely, willingly, joyfully, and lavishly. May these gifts we offer today and our lives bring you honor and glory and praise and do all that we can to further your kingdom. Multiply them for their use. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. The scripture today is from John 14, verses 8 through 12. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you sh say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This morning we have, uh, there are some notes in your bulletin as well. If you'd like to, they'd be helpful in following along, a brief note sheet that we're using for this series. Also gives you an opportunity to carry with you anything that, uh, that resonates uh, with you this morning as we uh, continue this series. This is week three out of week five. I'd love to say this is the entire series, but this is really only about the first half of it. But we're not going to continue on because I only wrote five sermons. So, uh, so today we're continuing. I know you're glad. You're like, only five, that's it? So we're, we're continuing, but we're shifting a bit this week. So we're, we, the first couple of weeks we have been talking about the impact of the small things in our life, that the small habits, that as we develop them, small habits of faith, how they can impact our life and over time produce within us great joy and have a great impact and so today we shift just a little bit in our talk about atomic discipleship. And, and what we mean by atomic is that we're not necessarily at the mushroom cloud point of atomic. We are really looking at the quantum items, the quantum, uh, uh, quantum mechanics, if you will, of our spiritual life. And so today we begin to share about th primary dimensions of an atomic life. Uh, atomic discipleship really is a three-dimensional discipleship. I know you're sitting there thinking, what in the world does he mean by three-dimensional? Well, I'm going to be spelling that out in detail today and the next two Sundays. But basically, there are three different spheres of relationships in our life. And that for, for atomic discipleship, we need all three dimensions working together. All three spheres of our life or relationships that we need to A, attend to, but also be cognizant of and aware of and intentionally investing in. But first, but first, let's remember that when we talk about atomic discipleship, it's truly about being faithful in the small things. Oftentimes in the life of faith, we think about those grand moments the miracles, if you will, the voice from heaven. But the reality is, for most people, discipleship of Jesus exists of these small investments, small moments, and small habits, being faithful in those small things. Committing our life to Jesus is as much about those small things uh, as much, and how those small things have a cumulative effect over a time in our life and in the kingdom of God. So that's really what we're discussing. And we know that the fruit that we see in our life is a result of the means that we employ in our life. And if we attend to the small things in the life of faith, that will lead to big results. So what are the small things that we need to attend to in our life? Well, as I mentioned, it's a three-dimensional conversation, and there are three dimensions of, uh, that our lives have, have, are shaped to look like the life of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus had a three-dimensional life as well. To be disciples, we understand that that means that a disciple hears his word, follows his example, and trains others in his mission. So 
if we were to sum that up for one word for each one, uh, discipleship is about character, it is about our competency, and it is about our collaboration. And so for the first part of the three-dimensional life of Jesus, it's all about character. Because if you don't have the character piece, all the rest of it is pretty insignificant in our life. So today we're looking at building up atomic character. Let's a uh, quick poll here. I'm just going to throw out a scenario, and we'll just take a quick head count, uh, a, a straw poll, if you will, on how we'd go about this. So here's the scenario. Let's say you've got a small child that's in your care, an infant. You're charged with their care, you and you alone. Something's come up and you need to find someone to take care of your child. You have a choice. You've got two people who are, who are at the ready. One is a very high character individual, trustworthy, reliable, loving, but has little to no experience with children of any sort. The other is a super competent person that's been caring for children for a really long time, proficient and efficient, but you can't trust them. They're nice, but you're not sure if you can leave them alone in your house. Which one do you pick? So let's go with the first one, the high character person, no experience. Some of you, all right, who would go with the second one? Very good at what they do, but you can't trust them as far as you can throw them. Great. All right. All right, let's, let's shift the scenario a bit. That might be kind of far out there, but maybe it's a sick loved one who can't take care of him, him or herself. You got a high character person and you got a high competency person. Like the previous example, who would you choose? Well, I'm currently in my fourth appointment as a pastor, and I've learned something that I actually learned in the Secret Service that I have carried with me um, into ministry. You know, in the, in the Secret Service, uh, I, uh, not many people know this, but I actually applied twice. The first time, I had no experience. Second time, I had, had a couple years of police experience. And in the service, I, you know, one of the things I realized was that the first thing, especially once I was in, uh, in the service, we hired people and we looked at their character first to be what kind of person they are. Because the motto of the service was that the serve, we were worthy of trust and confidence. And that means that integrity and character were of primary importance, regardless of maybe some headlines that you have seen uh, over the past few years. You see, in, in the service's mind, what they would think is that they could pretty much teach you to do anything that they wanted you to do. They can put the right tools in your hand and give you the right mechanics and the right actions and, and train your mind to do those things and your body to do those things. But the one thing they didn't have time to do was to build up your character because it takes a lot longer and it's a lot harder to develop high character. In the church, even as a pastor, I continue to look at character first. Character is always more important than competency. Because what you do flows from who you are. What you do flows from who you are. And believe it or not, this is especially true in discipleship. Especially when you think of discipleship from an atomic perspective. You can know the Bible. But if you're not a loving person, who cares? You can be a Christian. But if you're a jerk, who cares? Right? Westboro Baptist Church. Anybody familiar with Westboro Baptist Church? Sure, you could ask them a few questions about Scripture. They could answer them just right. Maybe even a few questions about basic Christian theology. They'd probably come up with a good answer, but due to the way they've acted and have come across as hateful, espousing anti-Semitism, picketing and demonstrating at funerals of those who lived against their views of human sexuality and attacking other Christian groups, it's a prime example. You can know Scripture, you can be a Christian, but if you're not loving, who cares? 
And that's a character issue. And when we think of this, we see an extreme example of a Christian church that doesn't seem to mirror the character of the one they purport to follow. You know, an example like that is pretty clear to us, isn't it? And while I have mentioned a very clear example uh, throughout the church, there are many examples within the church as well. There have been very public falls of well-known pastors, and those things seem to be a rather common occurrence more and more as time marches on. You know, there used to be a time where we joked about certain groups of professions that had bad character flaws, but rarely have we addressed the plank in our own eyes. Rarely have we taken time to reflect in the mirror. Because when it comes to having the character of Christ in our own life, the problem is not out there. It is in here and in here. I've heard people say, I uh, hate the sinner, uh, hate, hate, I love the sinner, hate the sin. I said it right the first time. Love the sinner, hate the sin. I've been taught a new way. Love the sinner and hate your own sin. We often understand that as long as we do things for God, then that means we are good with God. We often understand that doing for God is the same as being with God, but it simply isn't true. Not fully. Because being with God is the primary way for our character to be conformed to God's character. The more time you spend with God, the more you begin to resemble Him. Atomic discipleship calls for us, first and foremost, that first dimension is to work on our character. To build up character. And I use that word up, right? Because when we talk about character, that is about our up relationship. Our relationship with God. So when you think of the first dimension, think of up. And it's about our character as disciples of Jesus and as Christian people. Just because we've given our life to Jesus doesn't mean that all of our flaws are gone. We're to continue to grow in grace, to continue to grow in godliness and godly character. As John Wesley said for us Methodist people, we are to pursue Christian perfection so that our heart becomes as God's heart. And that we are made perfect in love and loving God and loving one another with the same love that God gives us. We have to continue to make small, to take small daily habits, and one of those is to actually be with God. Be with God. Because the more time you spend with God, the more you will begin to resemble God's heart. Uh, many years ago, I was at a, um, uh, when I was in youth ministry, Dr. Kara Powell. Uh, was giving a presentation, and she opened up with an admission that totally relieved me. She says, and she is a well-known, very uh, uh, well-regarded, high-regarded person throughout the youth ministry world, and her research and all has been invaluable to raising young people in the church for decades. But she said, it's scary to me how far I can get into my day without ever having thought about God. And I was just like, wow. And this was some 15 years ago. And I immediately thought about myself. Because when I hit the floor, you know, at that point, the, uh, my oldest two were a little bitty. And so once the alarm clock went off, it was time to hit the floor running because we had things to do and to get going. Got to get out the door because we had to be at work on time. All, all these things. And, it, and I to it totally resonated with me how scary it is sometimes how far i can get into my day without ever acknowledging god 
And so that's why this first dimension is so very important for our lives. And remember this thing right here, that the more time we spend with God, the more our heart will resemble God's heart. We still pursue for our lives to be transformed into the character of Christ. And as I said earlier, just because, uh, just because you say you're a Christian or follow Jesus or start being a disciple doesn't mean that all the bad parts of you go away. There's a pastor uh, and, and uh, a pastor and speaker who I've, I really enjoy, I've had really enjoyed learning from. His name is Pete Scazzaro. He talks about the emotionally healthy church and emotionally healthy leadership and emotionally healthy spirituality. And there's one thing that he says, you can have Jesus in your heart, but you still have grandpa in your bones. And as we spend time with God, we submit ourselves to God's inspection and correction so that we can be a more accurate reflection of his character. Jesus tells Philip, Did you know that the Father and I are one? Sure, this is a theological statement that father and son are the same. They are of the same substance. But then again, later in chapter 17 of John, the prayer is that for the disciples to be one with him, just as he is one with the father. What are we to make of that? To be one with Jesus and to one with God is to share the same community with the Almighty that means we are transformed by building up character. Working on the character of our lives, building and living into that up dimension so that we may be one, so that our heart may be just as God's heart. And this happens by spending time with the Lord. And I wish it was as easy as showing up to church once a week. But this is an every day, every moment, small thing that we have to be intentional about. Because there's no liturgy for it. There's not a right song. There's no church service that can do it for us. There's no class that we can take that's going to fit the bill completely. There's not a curriculum that will build up, build up character. It simply comes through being with God. Maybe in silence. Being fully present and inviting God to speak to you. Closing our mouth opening our mind and opening our ears. We see it many times that Jesus, he would get up and go away to a lonely place. The Greek word was eremos. He would get up before the day began, and that's how he maintained his connection with his heavenly Father. What about you? Because if we're thinking about discipleship it's not just about the education about god that we receive but it is about the connection that with god that we sustain we are created for this sort of connection so that the sort of character and and have this sort of character to love in this way but the instantaneous change that we seek isn't happening There is no magic wand. There is only atomic discipleship in which we intentionally build up character in our daily life by availing ourselves to the grace of God on an ongoing basis. So what are the small habits that help you do that? I'll rattle off about four here for you. But I'm sure there are lots of ways that many of you already know and live into this. Just sitting in silence. Finding a comfortable chair and just sitting in silence. I know some of you are saying, well, I'll fall asleep. 
Well, at least you're falling asleep in peace in the presence of the Lord. Maybe it is just sitting in silence and saying, Lord, I am here to be with you. Do with me as you will. Shape my heart. Change my life. Speak to me, O God. And then zip it. There's a practice that's called examine where you, at the end of your day, you do it at the end of your day, and you go through and you sort of take an inventory of your day. You can Google examine, E-X-A-M-E-N. Praying, with, praying the Scripture. You know, this year we've been uh, trying to read through the Old Testament, excuse me, the New Testament together. Every Friday in my pastor's e-note, I'll let you know what's coming up the next week. I just want to encourage you, you know, take that. Don't just read them as a perfunctory practice. Pray through those scriptures as you're reading them. What are you saying to me, God? And then maybe sometimes you just got to get away and be alone. Sometimes you just got to go to Shelby Farms and find a place where you can just get away from everybody. Sit in nature and practice solitude. Just you and the Lord. You see, it's these small, daily, or regular investments in this godly character over time that will yield to big, faithful results and to an overflowing life. But this right here, the character piece, this up dimension is the foundation for it all. By the time we wrap up, I'm going to tell you why it takes all three of these relationships. And I'm going to tell you how your life will be if you don't use all three. Because it's very predictable. But I want you to know today, continue to build your up relationship, your up dimension in your relationship with God. Continue to do it. And if you are not doing it in a way that's meaningful, find a way to begin today so that you might begin to live into the life that God has created for you and called you to live. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning as we conclude our time, I want to invite you and remind you that if there are any of those present who maybe feel like taking this discipleship journey as your first run and you want to simply claim that for yourself, claim Jesus as your Savior, as your Master in life, we'd love to celebrate that with you and encourage you and find ways to support you in that journey because discipleship is not a road that was meant to be traveled alone. It's meant to be traveled with other people. As I said once before, um, it's not a solo act. It takes a band. And so you need other people in your life. So if that's you today, we want to support you and walk alongside you in that. Uh, if there are those present this morning who wish to express their discipleship by uniting with Covenant United Methodist Church in membership, we'd love to receive you this morning as well. I, I want to invite you to stand as you are able. As we sing together, O Jesus, I have promised, verses 1 through 3, number 396 in your hymnal. The words are on the screen for you.
you'll remain standing for the blessing and benediction, I simply wanted to remind you, and I will remind you every week henceforth, a uh, reservation link has been sent out for our Restoration Celebration Sunday. Please be sure to RSVP. We will be serving you a free lunch only if you RSVP. All right? If you don't RSVP, you got to pay the whole bill. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do it. But please RSVP. That helps us make sure we have the uh, appropriate amount. We're going to have a great day, a great celebration. Our work is drawing to a close, and that will definitely be something that we can celebrate together. So please remember to RSVP for our restoration celebration on September the 10th. Receive these words as you go this morning. You've been embraced by the love of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and blessed by Jesus to go into the world to offer healing and hope. Go. Go in peace and go in power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.